This is the Music History In-Depth Podcast for September 25th through October 1st. On this week's show, a music festival ends in tragedy, two jazz icons pass away, plus we talk about Broadway and we give a birthday shout out to a queen and a dame who are both the same person. This show goes more in depth about some of the events that we put on our daily podcast, the Music History Today podcast, which drops every single day, including weekends, wherever you get your podcast from. Now, on to this week's episode. In 2014, MGM Resorts and Casinos in Las Vegas owned a vacant lot called Las Vegas Village across from their Luxor Hotel property and diagonally across from their Mandalay Bay Hotel property in what is technically Paradise, Nevada, which is the town next to Las Vegas. The lot is not technically in Las Vegas, even though it is part of the Las Vegas Strip. Anyway... MGM wasn't quite sure what it wanted to do with it at the time, so an idea was formed to use the lot for a three-day country music festival called the Route 91 Music Festival, named so because the lot was on Las Vegas Boulevard, which at one time was named United States Route 91. They partnered with Live Nation, and during the first few years, they were pretty successful. 2014's lineup featured Miranda Lambert, Blake Shelton, and Jason Aldean. 2015 featured Brett Eldridge, Tim McGraw, Keith Urban, Lady Antebellum, now of course known as Lady A, Gary Allen, Thomas Rhett, and Florida Georgia Line. And 2016's lineup featured Chris Young, Little Big Town, Brad Paisley, Toby Keith, and Luke Bryan. 2017 had a pretty powerhouse lineup as well. It featured country music artists Marin Morris, Lee Bryce, Eric Church, Jake Owen, Sam Hunt, and back for another go-round, Jason Aldean. The first two nights of the festival went off without a hitch. Night three started out okay as well. Somewhere around 9.20 to 9.30 p.m., the closing artist Jason Aldean went on stage and started his set. He played through his first six songs, They Don't Know, The Only Way I Know, Johnny Cash, Take a Little Ride, A Little More Summertime, and Any Old Bar Stool, all without incident. Then Jason started his seventh song, When She Says. Jason never got to finish the song that night because of someone who was diagonally across from where he was in a 32nd floor hotel suite of the Mandalay Bay Hotel. Before Stephen Craig Paddock was a high-stakes gambler who dropped tens of thousands of dollars in Las Vegas casinos playing high-stakes video poker, Stephen was a retired post office worker and accountant. He also owned a lot of rental property in Reno, Nevada, which made him very rich. Some reports had his wealth at over $2 million. His video poker winning apparently wasn't all that bad either, although he wasn't what anyone would technically call a high roller. He was just very good at it. He had developed a system where he applied algorithms to video poker to try and get an edge, which worked for a while. He grew up with a single mother, mainly due to his father, Benjamin Paddock, being a bank robber who at one time was even on the FBI's most wanted list. Some family members said that Stephen wanted his name to live in infamy, as he felt his father's name had. As time went on, though, Stephen felt that life had kind of turned sour for him. According to reports, he became angry that casinos weren't giving him some of the perks that he was accustomed to, like free rooms and such. There were reports that he was losing a lot of money, starting two years prior. He became depressed and started alienating his family and his girlfriend, whom he had met several years earlier and who was a casino worker at one time. According to people who knew him, Stephen said that doctors told him that he had a chemical imbalance that was incurable. He said that the doctors offered him antidepressants, but that Stephen would only take anxiety meds. 
Two weeks prior to the festival, Stephen sent his girlfriend to the Philippines to live with her family. He also wired her $150,000. According to her report to the police, Paddock had stayed in numerous rooms facing the festival in the month prior to the festival itself. He had also researched different cities in the months prior. He had looked at places in Boston, Massachusetts. He had booked a room that overlooked the Chicago Lollapalooza Festival, but for whatever reason, he decided not to go. He stayed at the Ogden Hotel in Las Vegas only two weeks earlier that overlooked the Life is Beautiful music festival, but again, he opted to leave things be. Stephen started getting gear for his plan starting in October 2016. In fact, from October 2016 to September 28, 2017, Stephen bought 55 guns, all of them legally. 24 of them ended up in his suites in Las Vegas. Among those were 14 AR-15 rifles and 8 AR-10 rifles. Some of the rifles were augmented with what they call bump stocks, which allow the rifles to fire 9 bullets per second. Think about that. 9 bullets per second. Just in this sentence, that's 9 times, well, however long I just said that. What, about 10 seconds? So 90 bullets in 10 seconds. There you go. Stephen checked into the Mandalay Bay Hotel on September 25th and received a complimentary suite in room 32-135. On September 29th, he checked into room 32-134 so he could have connecting rooms to give him more options for what he was about to do. According to all reports, he acted normally when he checked in, but he checked in a lot of baggage. He brought five bags on the 25th, seven bags on the 26th, two bags on the 28th, six bags on the 30th, and two bags on October 1st. Here's where I veer off the story for just a minute, if you will. Why didn't the hotel notice how many bags one person was bringing into a room, especially in a post-9-11 era? I mean, the guy brought 22 bags to his room for himself. 22 of them. Why didn't security just ask him a quick question about them? Was it the fact that he was a regular customer or something else that let him go unasked? (sighs) Anyway, back to what happened. Stephen spent his week going back and forth between the hotel and his home in Mesquite and also gambling at night. On September 30th, he put the Do Not Disturb signs up on the doors of both of the suites. On the evening of October 1st, at just before 10 p.m., hotel security noticed that an open-door security alarm was going off on the 32nd floor entry door. Security guard Jesus Campos was sent to investigate. When he tried the door... He couldn't open it up, so he went around the long way to the 32nd floor. When he got back to that door from the 32nd floor side, he noticed that someone had blocked it by screwing in an L-shaped bracket. He radioed it in and reported what he had found to the security office. Then at 10.05, he heard what sounded like someone drilling in room 32-135, So he went to investigate the noise and knocked on the door. He was met by a hail of 35 bullets going through the door, one of which hit Campos in the thigh. He escaped by sheltering in a nearby alcove between rooms and reported that shots were being fired. He made it back to the stairwell where he had investigated the door, where he found maintenance worker Stephen Shuck, who was already fixing the door. That was fast. After they found another place to hide, Stephen Shuck called in that shots were fired and for the hotel to call the police. Jesus Campos thought that he had been hit by a pellet gun. He couldn't have been more wrong. Stephen Paddock had fired one of the AR-15s, and he wasn't done. Not even close. After Paddock fired the gun through the door, he turned his attention to the festival of which he had a now perfect view. He broke two windows in both suites, 
set up his rifles, and as Jason Aldean was in the middle of singing the song when she says, Paddock opened fire, indiscriminately shooting at the crowd that was gathered across the street at the festival. The crowd originally thought that there were fireworks going off. Then they saw bodies hitting the ground and they realized what was happening. People began fleeing. Jason Aldean and his band, thankfully, got off the stage to safety. Others weren't so lucky. A lot of people were penned in because of a security fence that had been put up around the perimeter. Paddock continued spraying bullets into the crowd while also taking shots in an oil tank that was at nearby McCarran International Airport, now called Reed International after being renamed for former United States Senator Harry Reed in 2021 after the event happened. Paddock did hit the tank in hopes of blowing it up, but it was full of kerosene, and kerosene doesn't ignite when bullets hit it. So that Hollywood movie myth got busted pretty quickly. Once Paddock stopped for a minute to switch guns, a lot of those people were able to escape and find shelter in the nearby hotels. The airport was shut down as over 300 of those people escaped onto airport property. There were many heroes that night as civilians, along with off-duty military and first responders who were there just enjoying the festival, stepped in to help out. They tried to shelter people from the bullets that were coming at them and also administered first aid to victims, even as the gunshots continued to rain down upon the crowd. When cops finally arrived on the scene, they at first didn't know where the shots were coming from, even though hotel staff had told them that there were shots fired from the Mandalay Bay Hotel itself. But whatever. Why didn't they automatically go to the Mandalay Bay after security had called in the shots fired? That is a very good question. As officers went to the upper floors, finally... They checked the 31st floor instead of going to the 32nd floor. One of the officers heard the gunshots coming from the floor above them at 10.12 in the evening and upstairs to the 32nd floor. It took them five minutes to get upstairs as they made it upstairs at 10.17 after they had found and heard the shots at 10.12. That was when they found security guard Jesus Campos still on the floor. Campos then helped other floor guests evacuate the floor before finally getting medical treatment for his leg wound. Backup arrived on the floor between 1026 and 1030 and started clearing the 32nd floor room by room. The shooting had thankfully ended at 1015. At 1120 p.m., after police finally finished clearing the floor, They placed explosive charges onto the door of 32-135 and blew the door open to the room. Once they entered the room, they found Stephen Paddock on the floor, dead by his own hands an hour earlier. Stephen Paddock injured 867 people and killed 60 others. That's 6-0, 32 women and 22 men making it the deadliest mass shooting by one person in the history of mass shootings in America, which regrettably is a far too common occurrence. During the investigation into Paddock, no motive was ever officially released. There wasn't the usual manifesto as to why he did it that they normally leave around, and even though the terror group Islamic State tried to claim credit, That was actually quickly proven false, along with other conspiracy theories linking Paddock to Antifa and the shooting victims being harassed and being called crisis actors for some reason. Because really, people? Come on now. Some people tried to blame it on Paddock's supposed grievance against the hotels for not giving him as many perks as he he was used to getting. Still, others tried to use his depression and mental health issues, but none of those were ever proven to be factors in any of this. For starters, Paddock had this whole thing meticulously planned out and had scouted other locations in other cities, so the whole hotel grievance excuse is pretty much a non-starter as is blaming it on mental health issues, which seems to be everybody's go-to on these things. 
Honestly, some people are either evil from the outset or become evil for whatever reasons. No excuse. Also left unanswered was why he picked the Mandalay Bay Hotel, which was diagonally across and behind the festival area, and not the Luxor Hotel, which was closer and directly across the street from the festival and had a much better shot in any event. There were some other things that came out of this shooting. On the issue of guns, there were the usual promises made and then broken or blocked by the NRA or senators or congressmen or whoever. However, this one time, one time, at least one thing happened. In 2018, then United States Acting Attorney General Matthew Whitaker signed a regulation outlawing those bump stocks that made the rifles easier to fire. Unfortunately, the United States Supreme Court struck down the regulation in 2024, stating that it wasn't done through Congress, therefore unconstitutional, blah, blah, blah. There was also a police officer who was fired in 2019 for his actions that night as he stayed on the 31st floor instead of going up to the 32nd floor to help his other policemen. He was reinstated, though, in 2020 after he sued to get his job back and an arbitrator ruled in his favor. Mandalay Bay ended up renaming all of their floors, so now there's no 32nd floor. I mean, the floor still exists, obviously. It's just not called the 32nd floor. The two rooms that Paddock used were sealed off, never to be used again, at least by guests. As far as the festival grounds go, well, MGM gave two acres of it so it could be used for a memorial, while the rest of the property was sold. As of right now, it's still a parking lot. As far as the Route 91 Music Festival itself, that was canceled in 2018 out of respect for the victims. There was talk of moving the festival and starting it back up in 2019, but that didn't happen. COVID lockdowns hit in 2020 and into 2021, and the festival kind of disappeared after all that. As far as Jason Aldean went, he was scheduled to do a concert on October 7th in California. Instead, he spent that night in New York City, where he opened the TV show Saturday Night Live with the words, quote, I'm Jason Aldean. This week, we witnessed one of the worst tragedies in American history. Like everyone, I'm struggling to understand what happened that night and how to pick up the pieces and start to heal. So many people are hurting. There are children, parents, brothers, sisters, friends. They're all part of our family. So I want to say to them, we hurt for you and we hurt with you. And you can be sure we're going to walk through these tough times together every step of the way. Because when America is at its best, our bond and our spirit is unbreakable. End quote. Let me repeat that last line, actually, because it's rather pertinent to what's going on these days. Because when America is at its best, our bond and our spirit is unbreakable. Words to live by. Jason Aldean then performed the song, I Won't Back Down, by Tom Petty, as a tribute to both the victims of the shooting and also to Tom Petty, who had passed away earlier that week on October 2nd, 2017. The horrific mass shooting at the Route 91 Music Festival in Las Vegas, Nevada that killed 60 people and injured 867 others. October 1st, 2017. Before we go any further, we'd like to tell you about our other podcasts. 
The Music History Today podcast goes over the daily events in music history and drops daily, including weekends, on YouTube and wherever you get your podcasts. There's also the Music Halls of Fame podcast, which talks about a member of the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, along with other Music Halls of Fame's museums and walks of fame. The Music Halls of Fame podcast drops every Thursday and can also be found on YouTube and wherever you get your podcasts. Now, back to this podcast. Now we will talk about the lives of two musical icons who passed away this week in music history. First one goes to the ladies. She is called the Empress of the Blues. She is considered the most popular blues singer of the 1920s and 1930s. She influenced not only blues, but also jazz. She is Bessie Smith. Bessie Smith was born on April 15, 1894 in Chattanooga, Tennessee. Her parents both died by the time she was nine years old. Her older sister stepped in and raised her. Because of her poor upbringing, Bessie didn't get an education. Instead, her and her brother played music and sang on the streets of Chattanooga in order to make money for the family. When Bessie was a teenager, her brother went away with a traveling performance group. When he came back, he got Bessie an audition with the group itself. She was hired not as a singer, though, but as a dancer, because the group already had a singer the legendary Miss Ma Rainey. After a while, Bessie moved on to other groups and made a name for herself on the East Coast and the South between 1913 and 1920. Right around 1920, record labels started looking for black female singers to sign, mainly due to the popularity of the song Crazy Blues by Mamie Smith. No relation. By then, as record labels wanted to cash in on black female singers after excluding them for decades, Bessie was ready to dominate blues music. She signed a record deal with Columbia Records in 1923. After that, her career skyrocketed. She appeared on Broadway in one play and also appeared in one film called St. Louis Blues, which itself was inducted into the National Film Registry in 2006. However, she really made her mark with recordings, of which she made almost 200 recordings in her career and became one of the biggest stars of early recorded music. She also made her name and living with her appearances in speakeasies and on vaudeville stages. Her first record, Downhearted Blues, with the B-side, Gulf Coast Blues, was a smash hit. The song was written by jazz singer Alberta Hunter, with music written by pianist Lovey Austin. Hunter sang the first known version in Chicago with King Oliver's band out in Chicago, and then recorded it in 1922. In 1923, Bessie decided to record the song, but she only had Clarence Williams' piano accompanying her. The single sold 780,000 copies in the first six months and eventually sold over 2 million copies, which was no small task in 1923. Smith's version is considered one of the greatest songs of the 20th century, along with being selected for induction into the Grammy Hall of Fame. During her career, Bessie Smith became the highest paid African-American performer in the world, mainly due to her live performances, as she never received her proper royalties from her record sales with Columbia Records. Shocker. In fact, she at one time made $2,000 per show, which works out to over $35,000 in today's money. Bessie enjoyed the luxurious life so much that she traveled America for her gigs in a custom-made railway car, which, when you think about the treatment of African Americans during that time period, was pretty remarkable. Her personal life was colorful, to say the least. The lady stood at 5 foot 9 inches, weighed 200 pounds, and was tough. Once, according to legend, someone tried to stab her after she performed on stage in Chattanooga, Tennessee. With the knife still stuck in her chest, she chased after the person and then went to the hospital. She performed the next night as well. 
She also wasn't afraid to punch out a man, or woman, or two, or three. In fact, she knocked out her husband's mistress once Bessie caught them together. Bessie once had the Ku Klux Klan picket one of her shows. Bessie got so angry that she went out to the Klan themselves and yelled at them to leave or she would get angry, and they didn't want to see her get angry. I don't think she turned green, though. The Klan picked up and left, because even they knew better. Shocking there, too, actually. Bessie was also said to love three things in her life, singing, sex, and alcohol. And she did all three in heaping helpings. She enjoyed lots of sex with both men, women, and even the occasional combination of both from time to time, supposedly. Unfortunately, Bessie passed away on September 26, 1937, at the age of 43, when a car she was a passenger in collided with a truck. She had more than 10,000 people attend her funeral in Philadelphia. Her influence can be found in a number of singers, especially blues singers, that she left her mark on. In fact, Janis Joplin, not exactly a slouch in blues singing herself, paid for Bessie's headstone when she found out that Bessie was never given a proper headstone for her gravesite. On the headstone, Janice had the following phrase inscribed on it, quote, The greatest blues singer in the world will never stop singing. End quote. The life of the Empress of the Blues, the legendary Miss Bessie Smith, who passed away on September 26, 1937, at the age of 43. Next, trumpet player Miles Davis was born on May 26, 1926 in Alton, Illinois, and grew up in Illinois in an affluent family. His mother, a classically trained pianist, exposed him to music early and gave him his first trumpet at the age of nine. While still in high school, Miles played in a nightclub in Chicago called the Rum Boogie Club. He became the director of the house band there. He also had a daughter with his high school sweetheart named Irene Berth. Miles' mother wanted him to go to Fisk University, while his father told him that he should go to Juilliard in New York City. Davis listened to his father and went to college at the Juilliard School, which was then known as the Institute of Musical Arts. That was in 1944. But Miles ended up dropping out because, as he put it, they concentrated too much on European music. He decided to play the club scene with his mentor and friend, Charlie Parker, playing at the famed club Birdland in their house band. 1944 to 1948 is known as Miles's bebop era. It was during this time with Charlie Parker and his friend and fellow jazz man, Dizzy Gillespie, that he helped to develop the bebop style of jazz, along with stretching the genre to include modal music, cool jazz, and even rock music. He also had another child with Irene and also started a decades-long on-again, off-again relationship, we shall say, with drugs and alcohol. 1948 to 1950 was the Miles Davis Nonet era, as he experimented with using typical non-jazz instruments like the French horn and tuba. At this point, Miles worked with greats like Gil Evans and Jerry Mulligan and got himself off of drugs for a time, deciding to eat a vegetarian diet. During this time, he received criticism from black musicians for having white musicians in his band, but Davis didn't really care about a musician's color, only a musician's playing ability. He started influencing the West Coast version of jazz called Cool Jazz with all of his experimentation, culminating in recording sessions that would be released a decade later as the album Birth of the Cool, and a legendary album that is. Starting in 1948, Miles went back and forth to Paris, France, the first time in order to play at the inaugural Paris Jazz Festival. Paris fell in love with jazz during this period and embraced jazz musicians wholeheartedly. Paris left an impression on Miles. He played in clubs, hobnobbed with intellectuals, and had an affair with actress and singer Juliette Greco. 
He took a liking to Paris, where he thought at the time that France had treated black people in general and black musicians in particular better than in the United States. A later confrontation and beating at the hands of New York City police officers would cement that feeling about America and race relations in his head. During his tours in France, Miles recorded classic albums like Miles Ahead in 1957, Walkin' in 1956, and his live album In Concert at the Olympia Paris in 1957. When he came back to America in 1949, Miles' drug problems also came back after he had become depressed. His drug problems started creating financial difficulties for him, though. He also got back together with Irene Berth and fathered another child. However, his music and the drugs took over his life and he distanced himself from Irene and his children. In 1951, he signed a recording contract with Prestige Records, which gave him some money, but he then ended up spending it all on drugs. His life got to the point over the next couple of years that he was playing gigs just so he could score more heroin, which he was completely hooked on. His drug habit got so bad that it finally made him go live with his father for a time in 1953 in order to deal with his addiction. In 1954, fresh from temporarily kicking his drug habit, Miles moved back to New York City and started working with the Miles Davis Quartet. While there, Miles' style switched from bebop to hard bop after having been influenced by pianist Ahmad Jamal. 1956's album Blue Haze and 1957's album Walkin' helped to usher in this hard bop era. Miles developed his raspy voice in late 1955 when he had an operation to remove some polyps from his larynx. The doctors told him to remain quiet for his recovery, but he just couldn't help himself and started screaming during an argument, permanently damaging his vocal cords. In 1955, Miles made a comeback appearance at the Newport Jazz Festival. Columbia Records label head George Avakian signed Miles to a contract after hearing him at the festival, even though the recording contract with Prestige Records still had four more albums left on it. Avakian still got Miles to get material together in the interim and got Miles to form the Miles Davis Quintet with the legendary Mr. John Coltrane. The first thing that the quintet did was to record four albums in two months to take care of the prestige contract. Those albums were released in 1957, 1958, 1960, and 1961. In fact, a lot of Miles' albums would be recorded in one year and then spread out for later release. For instance, the above-mentioned quintet albums were actually recorded in April and October of 1956. The first album for Columbia Records was Roundabout Midnight. Miles then left in 1956 for a while to tour Europe, where he rekindled his relationship with Juliet Greco, which became a decade-long affair. When he got back to America to continue work with a quintet, he discovered that John Coltrane had picked up a drug habit, so he fired Coltrane, primarily because he did not want to fall off the wagon and get back into drugs. Miles returned to Paris in 1957 to record and play. Then he came back to New York City and got the quintet back together, but also added Coltrane, who had kicked his drug habit by then. Miles decided that he was sick of touring and wanted to settle down for a while, as he had met another woman, Frances Taylor, who he married in 1959 and divorced in 1968. Columbia Records recommended that he collaborate with Gil Evans, from 1957 to 1962, Miles and Gill made five albums together which showcased different styles, like pieces with orchestral units and Miles playing different instruments, such as the flugelhorn. This period also contained his 1959 classic album, Kind of Blue, which is still considered to be one of the greatest albums ever recorded. In the early 1960s, Miles went through a number of lineup changes, including working with Sonny Rollins, Herbie Hancock, Ron Carter, Wayne Shorter, and Tony Williams. Miles also went back to touring. 
Miles started to have health problems, though. He injured his hip during a tour of Japan and had to have hip replacement surgery in 1965. The surgery didn't work, and he re-injured his hip later in the year. In 1966, he had a liver infection, which put him back in the hospital. Right around this time, his album sales started to tank. He also started to drink alcohol again. He divorced Frances Taylor in 1968 and then married singer Betty Mabry that same year, only to divorce her the very next year in 1969. Thankfully, though, he started a relationship with actress Cicely Tyson, which lasted for decades, including their marriage from 1981 to 1989. Not without its bumps, of course, because, well, Miles, that's why. In the mid to late 1960s, Miles experimented with not using time signatures in his music. The result were albums like 1966's Miles Smiles and 1968's Miles in the Sky. This period from 1968 to 1975 was known as Miles' Electric Era. In 1969, Davis wanted to bring his music to a new generation who had grown up on Motown and James Brown. By that time, Davis had ex- started experimenting with electronic music and wanted to take it to the next level. He recorded his next album over three days in August. A lot of the album was improvised. The post-production was interesting as well. A lot of the songs were shorter versions pieced together to make a longer version. Song lengths ranged from anywhere from 4 minutes to 27 minutes. Also, there were multiple instruments playing different things at the same time. For instance, two bass players, one playing double bass and the other playing bass guitar. Davis also incorporated funk music into the songs. On March 30, 1970, the double album Bitches Brew was released. It became an influential album for 70s funk artists such as Sly Stone and George Clinton and Parliament Funkadelic. It also influenced Radiohead on their album OK Computer and spurred interest in jazz again in the mainstream, helping to create a new style of jazz called Jazz Fusion. The rest of the early part of the 1970s saw Miles experimenting more with Jazz Fusion. Between 1975 to 1980, Miles decided to take a hiatus from music. He fell completely off the wagon, falling into the trope of sex, drugs, and, well, more sex and drugs. If John Lennon had his famous lost weekend, which lasted for 18 months, then Miles had a lost year that lasted for a good five years. He did try to do some recording during this time period, but the drugs took their toll on his finances yet again. Miles started another comeback in the early 1980s. However, serious health issues threatened to derail his plans. In 1982, Miles suffered a stroke, which paralyzed his right hand, which is the hand you primarily play the trumpet with. After getting treatment from an acupuncturist for a few months, he was finally able to play again. He also kicked drugs and alcohol after a doctor told him that he wouldn't survive if he kept taking them. The stroke also scared him straight this time, but he was a diabetic by then and had to take insulin, which made him difficult to be around. He got back to recording and took up a new hobby, painting, which he became very good at. He also started acting, appearing on the TV show Miami Vice and in the movie Scrooged. I remember that scene. Ah, That was a good movie. The rest of the 1980s were spent playing and collaborating with artists like Prince and appearing on the Artists Against Apartheid protest album, Sun City. In the late 1980s, his health caught back up with him. He collapsed during a concert in Madrid in 1988. The tabloid Star Magazine ran a story that said that Miles was suffering from AIDS in 1989. Miles blamed an ex-lover for starting the rumor. But the truth was that his body was failing him, possibly from all the decades he abused it. He continued recording and doing performances and started getting Lifetime Achievements Awards and such. His final performance was at the Hollywood Bowl on August 25, 1991. 
just over a month later, he was gone. Miles Davis passed away from a combination of a stroke, pneumonia, and respiratory failure on September 28, 1991 in Santa Monica, California at the age of 65 years old. And maybe that's the thing. As huge a genius that he was, his demons were just as huge. He abused drugs, alcohol, and according to some reports, physically abused at least one woman. He definitely cheated on pretty much all of them. His real love of his life, though, was always his music. He sacrificed everything for it. His women, his family, and eventually, unfortunately, his own life. Perhaps the reason why he was such a great genius was because of the abuse he gave himself. We'll never know, but it's sad when you think about it. On a more positive note, though, Miles Davis released 60 studio albums, 39 live albums, 46 compilation albums, and 57 singles. He was nominated for 32 Grammy Awards, winning eight of them. He is one of the most influential musicians of not only 20th century music, but in all of Western music, no matter the century. His contributions and flat-out inventing of musical genres gave him the nickname the Picasso of Jazz. He was awarded a star on the Hollywood Walk of Fame in 1998 and was inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame in 2006. The Life of jazz icon Miles Davis, who passed away on September 28, 1991, at the age of 65. What say we do some honorable mentions and some birthdays in this last segment? First off, let's give an honorable mention to the date, September 29, 1991. On that date, MTV played Nirvana's Smell Like Teen Spirit music video for the first time. The video and the band helped to bring Seattle grunge sound into the mainstream. The 90s were never the same after that. That video not only ushered in grunge, but it also killed off hairband music. If you're wondering why this is just an honorable mention and not a full-blown celebration... Well, that's because I went in-depth on both the song and the band a few weeks ago in an earlier in-depth podcast. Search it out. believe it was somewhere in late August. Next, Mozart's The Magic Flute premiered on September 30th, 1791. It arrived to critical acclaim, although Mozart didn't live long enough to fully enjoy it. He passed away only a few months later. The opera is considered one of the top 10 most performed operas worldwide. Back in 1949, playwright Arthur Laurence, choreographer Jerome Robbins, and composer Leonard Bernstein had an idea for a musical. It was going to be about two star-crossed lovers, much like Shakespeare's Romeo and Juliet, only this time it would be set in present-day New York City. The lovers would be Catholic and Jewish, and they would call it East Side Story. That idea was completely tossed, and they pushed the whole thing to the side. In the mid-1950s, they all went back to the idea. This time, they changed it around a little. Instead of Jewish and Catholic lovers, they would be Latina and white. They also threw in rival gangs. They also added a new member to the team, lyricist Stephen Sondheim, who was just another unknown writer at that time. They also changed the name of the musical from East Side Story to West Side Story. Everything seemed to be going their way. They had the backing of producer Carol Crawford and investors. That is, until they caught wind of some of the changes. Crawford didn't like the fact that two of the main characters would be dead by the end of Act One. Because of that, Crawford and her investors pulled out of the project, and that was that. West Side Story was dead before it had even gotten off the ground. Enter producer and director Hal Prince. Hal Prince and Stephen Sondheim had a friendship, so during a conversation, Sondheim told Prince what had happened with Crawford. 
Prince said that he and his producing partner, Bobby Griffith, would come to New York to check out the production for themselves. They all met at Bernstein's apartment. And there, Bernstein played them the music. About halfway through the run-through, Prince caught himself humming along to the music. And it was then that he decided to help produce the musical. With fresh monetary backing, everyone went back to work. And finally, on September 26, 1957, West Side Story, the Broadway production, opened at the Winter Garden Theater to rave reviews. It would go on to have one of the longest runs in Broadway history, be nominated for six Tony Awards, winning two of them, and turn into an Academy Award winning movie. The musical that proves that sometimes connections mean everything, West Side Story, premiered on Broadway on September 26, 1957. The St. James Theater in New York City was originally called the Erlanger. It was built by Abraham Erlanger, where the original Sardi's restaurant once stood. It opened on September 26, 1927, with the production Mary Malone's. The famous Astor family gained control of the theater in 1930 after Erlanger's death because the Astors controlled and owned the land underneath the theater. Go figure. Anyway, they were the ones who renamed the theater St. James. The theaters changed ownerships a few times over the years and numerous renovations. Among the famous productions that have enjoyed successful runs there include Native Son, The King and I, The Pajama Game, Lil Abner, Hello Dolly, The Who's Tommy, The Producers, Dr. Seuss's How the Grinch Stole Christmas, and American Idiot. Also, Disney's Frozen, which as a godfather to two wonderful goddaughters and an uncle to an adorable niece, I can't tell you how much I've enjoyed having to listen to every song from Frozen. Really, I can't begin to tell you because I haven't enjoyed it. Yeah, I know. Let it go. Anyway, the legendary St. James Theater opened on Broadway on September 26th, 1927. These next honorable mentions are birthdays. The first two people have played royalty, but both have musical background. First, in West Philadelphia, born and raised on the playground was where he spent most of his days. That is, until he hooked up with his lifelong friend, DJ Jazzy Jeff. After turning down a scholarship to MIT to pursue a rap career, a decision that did not sit well with his family, I am sure, he struck pay dirt right out of the gate with the album Rock the House. After piling up hit after hit, Quincy Jones produced the show with him called The Fresh Prince of Bel-Air. From there, movie roles in Independence Day, Bad Boys, Men in Black, and a bunch of others followed. He's been nominated for three Academy Awards, winning one, and he won the first rap single Grammy for Parents Just Don't Understand. During his amazing run of big tentpole movies that became known as Big Willy Weekend, he managed to continue his rap career with solo hits like Getting Jiggy With It, Miami, and of course the Men in Black theme song. Guess dropping that scholarship in pursuit of a dream paid off. Also, Word to the wise, keep his wife's name off your lips or you're going to get smacked. Just ask Chris Rock. I think his face still hurts. The Fresh Prince of Bel-Air, Mr. Will Smith, born September 25th, 1968. This next woman is no stranger to Broadway, having debuted on Broadway in The, the Boyfriend. She was also in My Fair Lady and Camelot. She made her film debut in Mary Poppins and has starred in numerous films ever since, including The Sound of Music and Victor Victoria. She has also played two queens, twice in the Princess Diary movies and three times in the Shrek animated movies. The woman born in Walton on Thames, Surrey, England, with the golden voice who has played queens, but is in real life a dame. Dame Julie Andrews, 
born October 1st, 1935. Finally, this man packed a lot of important work in his short time on Earth, but man, what works they were. He and his older brother Ira wrote the Broadway opera Porgy and Bess, which is considered one of the most important American operas of the past century. He started out writing songs on the famous Tin Pan Alley. He switched into classical music and came up with a number called Rhapsody in Blue. While in Paris, he wrote An American in Paris. Rhapsody and American are to this day considered part of the Great American Songbook along with Porgy and Bess. He and his brother wrote numerous film scores together until his untimely death from a brain tumor at the age of 38. He and his brother are both considered two of the most important composers of the 20th century. Sometimes it's not about how many years you live, it's about what you do with them. Ira's younger brother, who was born in New York City, Mr. George Gershwin, born September 26th, 1898. And that is it for the Music History In-Depth podcast for September 25th through October 1st. Thanks for listening and or watching. <laughs>